Hi again. This is W.C. Stevenson, Year of Doom 1975, written in the mid-60s. He's an ex-circuit servant, so his insights are very valuable, giving us a different angle, looking forward to 1975, not backwards to it, as we do. And here he's talking about, will they survive the next debacle? Because he, by this, this, this uh, time, he is quite aware that they've had this experience, they've gone through this experience at least three times before he came along in the early 50s. I think that the most one can do at first is to point out some of the most obvious chinks in the witness's armor. Here he's giving a lot of advice to people who have to deal with them door to door. He's concerned that many people will not be armed so that the best they can do is avoid Jehovah's Witnesses, unfortunately. But, but Christians who are more skilled in the Bible, well, they have a responsibility to do something. But he says, point out some of the most obvious chinks in the witness's armor. Don't get involved in a text-to-text -text comparison, as most Christians, evangelicals, tend to do. Point out the chinks, and what's, what does he mean by that? The absurd chronology. That's the foundation of all of it, of course, the Watchtower's theology. The isolation of verses from their context, as in the case of texts used to condemn blood transfusions. In doing this, it is most important to be constructive at the same time, to express one's own belief in the power of God and his word, to make a better person of an individual, to concentrate on the Bible teachings, on charity, and the basic Christian virtues, and to discuss these things with the witnesses. In this way, a Christian can convince the witness of his own sincerity and his deep love of God and respect for his word, of which virtues the witnesses at present believe they hold the sole monopoly. The church can thus be presented in a new light to the witnesses, not as an institution full of hypocrites and pious sinners, which is how he is instructed to see it, but as a congregation of sincere believers holding a faith which is not just dependent, like his, on the fulfillment of prophecy in the next few years, but which is based on an intelligent approach to Scripture and which has stood the test of centuries of time. This is so important because one of the reasons why the witnesses cling so tenaciously to their beliefs, even when assailed by doubts, is because they cannot visualize that there is anything else to fill the void that would be created by the disintegration of their beliefs. Where would we be without the truth? Truth with a capital T is a continual rallying call to the faithful. In this respect, I believe that other Christians will be able to help the witnesses much more than someone who has little or no religious faith. A purely destructive approach will accomplish little. For this reason, this chapter, while saying something that I believe is, it is essential should be said, will do more than act as the thin edge of the wedge. Something must be offered in place of what is being taken away. The church can do much to help in this matter and should treat the witnesses as a challenge to its evangelistic powers and its basic Christian charity. There are two reactions which Christians often adopt when accosted by the witnesses at the doorstep, which do more harm than good, and I mention them as reactions to avoid, if possible. The first is the emotional evangelistic approach. It is usually begun by the Christian asking the witness, are you saved? And continues with a personal testimony of faith, which begins, I believe that Jesus Christ is my personal savior. I'm not criticizing a person who sincerely feels like this, of course, but what I do want to say is that this type of approach is of no value whatever in trying to help the witnesses. The religious beliefs of the witnesses are arrived at by study, by taking in knowledge of the movement's teachings. Becoming a Jehovah's Witness is not an emotional experience, it is an intellectual exercise. With this type of background of religious training, the witnesses are deeply suspicious of anything which, to them, savors of emotionalism. Because of their training, it is virtually impossible to communicate a personal experience of Christianity to them. For this reason, the methods of Billy Graham, for instance, leave them completely cold. Reason with the witnesses by all means, but do not try to win them over by an emotional appeal. It is a pity that for the witnesses, Christianity is not really a personal emotional experience at all. But since this is so, the narration of one's own personal experience will help them little. 
The other reaction, which should at all costs be avoided, is, I think, usually an involuntary one. The worst possible thing a Christian could say to the witness calling is, thank you very much, but I have my church, and then slam the door. This happens far too often, and apart from the appalling smugness and self-satisfaction which it betrays, is a shirking of Christian duty. The witness who calls at the door to help you in this way, in his way that is, is himself in need of help, help which an educated Christian is in the best possible position to give. It may be very annoying to reflect that the witness thinks you are one of Satan's agents because you attend church, that you are following in the skirts of the mother of the harlots, Babylon the Great, and has a bag full of literature under his arm, which says so in no uncertain terms. But as Paul put it, love is long-suffering and kind. It does not become provoked. It does not keep account of the injury. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 and 5. The witnesses are, as people, worth helping. They are, for the most part, people with a deep sense of devotion and loyalty, completely sincere, and with a tremendous capacity for self-sacrifice. With such qualities, they could be accomplishing so much good in so many worthy causes and fields of human endeavor. I would strongly recommend that a person who feels keenly about this and would like to help the witnesses consider some of the suggestions these suggestions, and also read the chapter in Anthony Hokima's book, The Four Major Cults, which gives much helpful advice on how to talk to members of such cults. Now we've done about seven or eight videos on Hokima's chapter in The Four Major Cults. It's mostly on the last chapter, as I recall, and there's, there's oh, dozens and dozens of pages of information in that book, which I didn't even get to, but what we did get to in, in the how-to of it, the summary of it, is, is constituting now seven or eight videos. I'll put the first of those on your screen, and uh, they're linked. See you next time.